It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. In the field, number 70. We're talking about practice. Hello, you play to win the game. The Yankees are champions of baseball. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Three, two, one. Happy 2000. No time on the clock. And the Patriots have won Super Bowl 36. Jordan open. Chicago with the lead. Worldwide Sports Radio Network presents Below the Mark. And we are finally back. As I tell you all the time, we are always live here for Below the Mic every single Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. New York Eastern Time. Remember, you can go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com and you can call us at 631 631- Nine six five four nine nine zero. And remember, guys, if you don't have our apps, well, guys, download our app. If you have Android, you go to the search bar on your Play Store and you go to Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Or you can go to the iOS and put in WWSRN. Download the app. It's for all the fans. They can listen to our shows live. You can follow us on all the different things, all the different stories that we put up, we post. So check it out. Check it out. But... We have a great show lined up for you guys today. We will be talking to, at 6.30, Hawaiian football wide receiver recruit Riley Wilson. And we'll be talking to former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Dyrell Briggs uh, at 7.15. So definitely stay tuned for that. Uh, Again, I want to apologize to all the fans if we had any technical difficulties before we we started the show. Everything is up and running. So all you fans out there that listen to our show every single day, we... We're happy to have you guys listening to us every single day on all our shows. The Big Guys Sports Show, The Wise Guys, we have Off the Mat. We have great shows, and we have new shows lined up in the next couple of weeks that are going to be added to our network. But as you guys know, today is Thursday. And what do we do today? We talk about entertainment and sports throughout the week. Top five NBA duos that could break up next season. Now, there are talks uh, right now going on with Portland that Damian Lillard might want out with Portland. There were stories coming out over the last couple of weeks that Damian Lillard wants to be possibly a New York Nick. I know this is just a story. It's a rumor. But uh, I don't know if you're going to see C.J. McCullough and Damian Lillard on the team very much longer. I do believe that Damian Lillard wants to go to a big city. It could be L.A., it could be the Knicks, it could be San Antonio. So that definitely keep your eye on that. It was very interesting for a while because McCollum was always the one in rumors. Now it's interesting. It could be Lillard. Jack Prescott favored to land with a surprise team next year. Does anybody give a crap where Dak Prescott goes? Now, I, I like Dak Prescott, but Dak is a guy that is expecting 35 to $40 million. I don't know who's going to pay him that kind of money. No matter where he goes, this guy is a middle-of-the-pack type of quarterback. He's an Andy Dalton type of quarterback, who, by the way, might be starting for the Cowboys this year. So I am very intrigued to hear where Dak Prescott believes he's going to play next year if it isn't the Dallas Cowboys. NFL rumors and news. League to create COVID-19 classification. Pro football rumors. After much discussion of the topic, the league and the union have agreed to modifications of the IR rules. According to Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk, players who test positive for COVID-19 will be placed on the new COVID-19 list, which means, ladies and gentlemen, that they will not be playing for two to three weeks if they're tested for COVID throughout the season. Did Daniel Snyder pimp out cheerleaders? Speculations of bombshell story about to come out. I know a lot of people believe this. I don't know if the stories are true, but a lot of people believe Jay Gruden's behind it as well. Mm -hmm. If it is true, I believe Daniel Snyder is going to be asked to sell and sell his team and sell his ownership of the Washington Redskins, which which could be the Washington something. Yeah, in the and, next couple of weeks. And remember, this was the same team that had their cheerleaders uh, sue them as well. I think four years ago, when they were forced to post topless somewhere else so this could definitely be an ongoing thing for going a while and jay gruden from what i heard is possibly involved too nfl pa preparing for salary cap to drop next season 
We're not surprised, ladies and gentlemen, with the COVID-19 situation. Teams are going to have to bring the salary cap down because they're not going to be able to afford all these different contracts that they might have to produce at the end of the season. So I do believe you will see some change in the salary cap. Josh Norman posts a cryptic tweet, rumors about Washington football team turmoil. I'm not surprised that Josh Norman wanted to get the hell out of there. He goes to Buffalo, and I'm sure he has something to do with it as well. I mean, this story is just, they're going to get worse and worse and worse. Not only for the Washington Redskins, but other teams that have done this before. I do believe things are going to come out just like with the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox. Now you're hearing the Yankees, so I'm not surprised. (laughs) NBA news. NBA players should look at the bubble from different approaches. With the NBA teams now inside Disney World bubble, players have began providing updates on how their first few days have been inside the insulated facility. As it appears, the overwhelming reaction we all been seeing from players themselves all seem to rant about this situation. Now, we all know uh, Zion Williamson has taken a step out of the bubble. He's got family situation. There'll be other players that are going to be coming out of the bubble because I don't believe they're going to continuously keep doing this. I think there's going to be a lot of speculations, a lot of cryptic situations going on in the NBA, especially moving forward with the season and the playoff run. So uh, don't be so surprised if you hear other players leaving because of family situation. Especially if someone high, pro- high profile as Zion Williamson does it. You know other players are not going to be afraid to either. Golden State Warriors can create the next dynasty, the Big Four. The Warriors are often a major talking point in the NBA because of their attractive style of play with some all-time great NBA figures such as Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr? Steve Give me a Kerr? break. <laughs> really? But it's the Warriors' winning culture and dedication to excellence to make them such a great, dominant team. A lot of people believe there will be another player, possibly the Greek Freak, or maybe Anthony Davis, who's going to be a free agent next year, to kind of move over there to Golden State and create another Big Four I do not believe that's going to happen. If there's any big four that's going to happen, it will be because of a young player they're going to draft in this year's draft. Even if it, even if it does become that, wouldn't it just be the same uh, same dynasty, not another one? <laughs> I mean, they just won two years ago. <laughs> Victor onto the Kupo. busted knee, not uh, not the only fracture experience with the Pacers. Less than two weeks uh, uh, after ruling himself out of the NBA's restart in Florida. Pacers guard Victor Onovacupo has reversed course of reevaluating how he is feeling. There had been four months between team organization activities. I'm definitely here trying to play this season. I don't know if he's going to play. I think the COVID-19 has a lot to do with it. Don't be so surprised if you do not see Victor on the court. Right. Between that and that being a major injury that he had, I can't imagine it either. Zion Williamson missed practice time before leaving the bubble. I am not I, I am not surprised about that. I believe Zion Williamson is leaving because of the COVID-19. Uh, I don't know his health situation. I'm sure there's other situations that he's got to worry about, especially with his family. I am not surprised at Zion Williamson. Don't be so surprised if Zion Williamson, if, they do, if the Pelicans do make the playoffs, he will not be in the playoffs playing with them. So I wouldn't be so surprised about that. MLB rumors and news. So maybe the Jays have been given permission to play at Rogers Center. Now, I'm not surprised Toronto right now. It's it's not as bad as it is here in the United States. I do believe the Jays are going to play at home. The question is, with everything that's going on with the COVID-19 over there, with the NHL teams, and all the transitions of some of these teams and some of these organizations possibly um, having the NHL Stanley Cup Finals and Stanley Cup Playoffs in the, in Toronto and Edmonton, I don't know how this is going to work moving forward for the Toronto Blue Jays. But again, they, they can't really diminish one team just because another sport has to interfere like that. I, I don't think that's fair of the Blue Jays to have them, have them play somewhere else. Alex Rodriguez won't call Mets Sunday night baseball games this season. <laughs> Why am I not surprised when he's making a bid for the New York Mets? I don't know what the hell is going on with the New York Mets. I would have thought right now you would think that the Mets would have had an owner. They would have uh, finally agreed to ownership to Cohen or the Alex Rodriguez group or the Harris group. 
We haven't heard anything. And we've heard there's a surprise ownership group out there. And I've been hearing it could be Mark Cuban. Yeah, so. when, you, when you told me that on Monday, I was surprised. But again, he has the money to do it. So don't be surprised if it's him either. But it's not surprising it's Draggy on. It's the Wilpons. <laughs> and the last story of the day. The Nationals explore an alternate site for season opener. I am not surprised. They play the Yankees. And right, right now with the Washington with Washington being a high place for COVID-19, they're going to be looking for another destination. Shout out to Charlie Slows yep. over there, the radio guy, the radio voice of the Nationals. So hopefully he's okay over there in, in Washington right now and he's safe. Safe and sound. Yeah, especially since it's a big tourist attraction. Too. And that is it for the entertainment and sports for this week on Below the Mic. Well, I will tell you guys something. Uh, this whole Washington Redskins situation, I, I knew there's a lot of turbulence over there. I, I know a lot of people like to point their fingers at ownership and Daniel Schneider, and it, it has a lot to do with it. But it doesn't really fit in everything that you're hearing. Now, if Jay Gruden had something to do with this, maybe that's the reason why he got fired, because I know Daniel Schneider loved Jay Gruden. Mm-hmm. Absolutely loved him. And then you're hearing stories that he was going to be out, especially if they didn't have a winning season last year. And I think last year, not last year, the year before, I, no, it was last year. They were 8-8 eight and eight last year or 7 No, and- last year they were terrible. The year before, they were 6-5 and five and leading the division until the Alex Smith injury. So, and I know the stories are coming out that uh, they there could be a scandal with the Alex Smith situation. I... I don't know if anything is true, and when the stories come out, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stories that are going to come out in the next couple of weeks, uh, maybe Daniel Schneider will be on his way out. Maybe the league will try to force him to sell the team. But with his ownership and his money, and he's one of the richest owners in, right now in professional football, mm-hmm. I still don't think it's going to be easy trying to get him out of ownership with the Washington Redskins. So I don't know if Washington Redskins are going to get their hopes up, but if they do plan or they do think – that Daniel Schneider is going to go. He's going to go out without a fight. They're at, they're absolutely sadly mistaken. I think right. Daniel Schneider, the person that he is and the owner that he is, he is going to fight all the way to the end and argue his points on whatever stories are going to come out. If it, if it is the cheerleaders or it is mm-hmm. sixteen people work, sixteen women that have worked under yeah. Daniel Schneider or the ownership or the executives uh, that have had sexual r- harassment, not only from the ownership or some of the executives. I, I do believe that Daniel Schneider will find a way out of this. Um, it, this isn't the same thing with the Clippers, uh, with the racist terms. This right. is something completely different. Now, uh, domestic violence and what the NFL is trying to keep away from the league and hurting women or all the stuff that we heard over the last couple of years with the Greg Hardys, uh, with the um, the Rice situations, uh, and, and really with the Brown situation with the New York Giants. Right. They're trying to keep domestic violence and, and, and hurtful situations for the the women in this world, and, and they're trying to protect the women. So uh, I do believe that if this story is coming out and if there is any truth to the story, Daniel Schneider will, one way or another, Goodell will try to force him out of ownership. I just don't know if he has any ability to do that. Yeah, it's interesting, too, with uh, the Alex Smith stuff that also came out, too, because from what I was reading, obviously not official because uh, the Post thing just leaked. I was reading it before that, but uh, Jay Gruden was – uh, involved in one of the with one of the players' girlfriends, Capri Bibbs, who's one of the backup running backs, and this was two years ago when everyone seemed to get hurt on that team. And the guy that was replacing him missed the block that caused Alex Smith to have that gruesome injury. And if that is ends up being the case, they have a lawsuit for the injury cases too. And we've seen the Redskins players, even star players, have had a lot of injury problems there. I know I mentioned on other shows, I think they're one of the three most injury-prone teams. And outside of Ryan Kerrigan, you don't really see a lot of the guys that are on that team be healthy a lot. And Trent Williams sued them uh, with his uh, with his cancer that he had that they misdiagnosed it. So there's a lot of issues going on with that as well. So it's, it's I think it's going to be blowing up even more than even just what we saw just recently today. It's going to be a question that only Daniel Schneider and the executives of the organization are going to be able to answer. Uh, also, when you when you look at the story, and there it, there's going to be a lot of stories that are going to come out from the Washington Sentinel uh, because that's the popular newspaper out there. Uh, I do believe that there is some truth to these stories. I don't know how much truth, but there has to be some kind of truth to this story mm. because anything that you've heard over the last couple of seasons and really with this team and the turmoil that this team has had and with the talent that this team has had, bring in Ron Rivera. And, and I think he's going to help this team grow and some of these young pe- people to grow and y- young players to grow. 
I, I don't understand if it, I'm sure Ron Rivera, before he decided to take this job, he had some kind of uh, understanding of some of these stories that were coming out because these stories have been going on. If, if this story is now hitting uh, the newspapers, there has to be some kind of truth or this has been an, under an investigation for the last couple of years. Right. And again, it, it goes back even further just throughout the tenure of Snyder, even into the 2000s. Uh, earlier this decade, we've seen all the, a lot of these players get frustrated with the organization and end up getting these bad, bad injuries. And then going back, back to the employees, like we were saying, 15 women, female employees have filed uh, lawsuits against him too, which again, obviously is a terrible look. We're seeing, play we see players get suspended for that kind of stuff all the time. And now we're do doing it inside like that. There's way too much in terms of shadiness. And again, I think there could be even more. I heard something where they may, he may be paying off referees, which I think other owners do too, to some extent, but that that's a bad look in itself and maybe shows the refereeing bias in the league. Well, too. money talks, right? In the NFL, billionaires. And, and I'll tell you this. When you look at the big picture right now with this story coming out, it is going to be a big story for the next couple of weeks because there's really nothing going on in sports. If baseball does start next week, which quite possibly will ha could happen, mm -hmm. and it probably will happen on Thursday with the Yankees and the Nationals, that's the first game of the season. If it does happen, there will be something to talk about when it comes to sports. But this story could hit in so many different ways, especially when they plan for OTAs to start in the next couple of weeks. And the Washington Redskins, this could be right there on the belly of where these OTAs are going to be starting. Ron Rivera is going to have to answer questions. So will Daniel Schneider and even Jay Gruden, who right now is the offensive coordinator for um, Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to answer questions because he was behind a lot of the situation, a lot of stories that are coming out here as well. So, uh, Jay, if if this happened in Jay Gruden's term, Jay Gruden knew something about it. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and and to me, there's a lot of investigation. This just didn't come out. There was an investigation. It usually takes either 12 to 14 months to investigate a story. So this story was absolutely investigated on, and whatever story comes out in the Washington Senate, I absolutely believe that most of this story, about 80 or 85% of the story, is true. And if, so, if this does drag on, don't be surprised if, whether it's younger players or top players on that team, don't, don't, don't be surprised if they start holding out and wanting out of that organization, too. It could get really ugly fast talent-wise if that's the case. Well, that's going to have to be Daniel Schneider's problem. It's not anybody else's problem. But when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be talking to Hawaiian football wide receiver and recruit. Riley Wilson. There you go. Here on Below the Mic. It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Six three one nine six five four nine nine zero is the number. This is below the mic. As you know, we are live every single Thursday from six p.m. to eight p.m. New York Eastern Time. Remember, you can call us at well, you can call us at six three one nine six five four nine nine zero. You can go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. As you guys know, I told you we had two special guests. Our first guest is a wide receiver that was recruited by Hawaii. I'd like to introduce Hawaiian recruit wide receiver Riley Wilson. What's going on, Riley? How's it going? We are good, my friend. How are you doing, my friend? Man, I just got out of my 14-day quarantine. I'm living in paradise. I can't complain right now. Living in paradise? Oh, absolutely. Come on now. How how are you feeling? Uh, how are you and your family doing right now with this pandemic? I mean, at first off, it was kind of, you know, we're from Texas, uh, kind of just thought you could kill the virus with our guns. But <laughs> as you can see now, it's getting a lot more serious. So kind of had to strap things down and definitely wearing a mask when you go out 100% now. Is that what you're doing? You know, I would have never thought, Riley, that we would be going out to restaurants and walking into restaurants. We have to wear a mask. We have to walk all the way to our table and sit down and wait until the waitress comes to us before we can take our mask off. Did you ever think yep, that we would be dealing with this right now? No, no. Times have changed, and it's a, it's a different adaptation, I'll tell you that. Never, never I think I ever have to wear a mask when I go out. It's like losing your identity or your id mm. like i'll be walking outside of my apartment and i'm like oh gosh i gotta go get my mask 
Well, or you'd be saying you have to get your dancing shoes, right? <laughs> I mean, you got to get your mask and your dancing shoes. So when you when you walk out of your apartment, you can do your dance and say, well, I got a mask. I got a mask. I got a mask. Anyways. <laughs> he's in Hawaii. He might not need shoes. Well, that's true. And by the way, <laughs> my partner over here, he's representing Hawaii, Hawaii and the way they uh, – Wear their crazy lays and necklaces. <laughs> lays. So he is wearing these lays for you, my friend. Really? Yeah, I'm telling you. When you watch, watch, watch the, the video feed after, you'll see. You'll when see you that. watch the video feed, you'll see him wearing lays. I mean, I don't understand why this kid is sitting right next to me. I was sitting, I was getting ready for the interview, and then all of a sudden I look beside me, and he says, "Look what I'm wearing," and he's wearing <laughs> lays, man. And I said, "What the hell are you wearing lays for?" I wish I had more of them. There's more at my house in Connecticut. Come oh on, you gotta, you gotta adapt to the culture now. Come on now. What culture, man? I mean, I'm right, I'm now, right now, right now. Thank I'm, you. Listen, Riley, I am here in New York, in Long Island, in this sweat box of a place, okay? It's humid. I feel like I'm in a sauna. And then I'm sitting here in the studios with all these green screen lights paling on me. And, and I can't put an air conditioning on because um, we don't want it to catch in our sound uh, for our studio and everything like that. So I'm sitting here in a sweat box talking to you. So I hope you're happy, my friends. <laughs> I think I think you'd be jealous of where I am. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. You're in Hawaii, man. I mean, I aloha. <laughs> I mean, seriously, aloha. Yes. Do yeah. you use that term? I mean, I, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm adapting to the you know the culture change 100. percent It's a lot different than Texas, but I do have aloha down. I do have that down. You seem like you do. You, you definitely seem like you have a personality. So why don't we get into oh. some football conversation, my friends? Yes, sir. All right, so tell us a little bit about your high school career and what made you decide to go to Hawaii. Out of all the different teams that were recruiting you, you picked Hawaii. Why did you pick Hawaii? Well, I got recruited by a lot of different schools, but the reason I chose Hawaii was just solely because of Coach Graham. I mean, he's a family-based program, and he's going to build this football team off a foundation of brotherhood and respect. And, like, that's how my high school team was. So from whenever I was getting recruited, I was like, for myself, could I spend four years, eight hours away from home, what kind of coach do I want? And Coach Graham is the perfect image of the coach I want. Someone who's going to push me on and off the field academically and set me up ultimately whenever I have to put the football down and you ready for the real world. Riley, I could have pushed you. I could be your coach, all right? You, I don't have a team right now that I'm coaching, but I can have a playground team. You could join my team. I could push you. You'd be right in the yeah. NFL right now. If, if you were on my team, I would push you to the limit that you'd be sweating your you-know-what's off. And be, before you know it, before you know it, you'd be drafted by the New York Jets because we need a wide receiver. How's that sound? Oh, gosh. Jets. The Jets. I'm a Jets fan, man. You're talking to Long Island, man. Mm. We're in Strong Island. Mm. Now you're hating on the Jets? Mm. Come on. You, I know you're going to hate this. I know you're going to hate this, but i got to stick with my Cowboys now. Oh, my God. Oh. First of all, first of all, <laughs> the Jets have nothing to do with the Cowboys. They have nothing. That's did, the Giants. They beat the Cowboys uh, this year. <laughs> they did. They did. They did beat the Cowboys. I know Jamal. I know your boy Jamal Adam likes the Cowboys. Yeah, right? well, <laughs> let him go, baby. Let him go. <laughs> all right. Now that we know you're a Cowboys fan, I have to ask this. <laughs> all right. So... My my host over here is one of the few supporters of Jason Garrett in the world. Love him. And, okay. and he also is one of the few slanderers of the Mike McCarthy hire yep. of him coming to the Cowboys. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Not because Mike McCarthy's a bad coach, just because of the fit. So, what are your thoughts to both of those, and do you agree with him? I mean, I will definitely agree with him that, uh, actually, no. I, I, I <laughs> what am I saying? No. Absolutely. Well, hold on. I, uh, hold on, Riley. Say he's gone. I am very glad to say he's gone. Well, hold on. You, 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 you want, you're glad that he's gone, but if you look at their offensive numbers in the last four or five years, they haven't had offensive numbers like this. I don't even remember the last time they had offensive numbers like this. Go look at their numbers. Go look at Dak Prescott. I mean, you have I a backup agree. quarterback playing at the starting position. But I would also have to say that had to do with the type of players we had. I don't really think Coach Garrett was the one that was – pushing them. I think the Dak and Ezekiel and Amari Cooper was really 
the leader of the offense. I think they were the ones calling. The you know what the were. leader of the Cowboys were? Was my underwear, okay? That's, that was the leader <laughs> of the Cowboys, okay? All right, I, you put my underwear on a stick, and you wave it up as a flag, and then they start playing, okay? That's... <laughs> That's we'll why. See. We'll see what happens this year. No, no, no. Oh, you, you will. You'll see my underwear hanging from the pole. <laughs> and you'll say, oh, I, right, I, I interview with that guy. I, I, know, I know that underwear. Anyways, as you guys know, we are talking to Hawaiian football wide receiving recruit Riley Wilson. Now, Riley, when you look at your high school career and now you're moving on to college and you see the speed of the game and everybody talks about the NFL, how fast the game is from college football, what are your thoughts to the different type of game that you're going to be playing from college football, from high school football, and where do you see yourself moving forward from college to the NFL? I mean, the biggest exception from high school to college is you pretty much hit yourself. It's a lot of tempo-based. Uh, it's a lot more the people who stand out are the playmakers, you know, and the guys who are going to get the ball, the guys who are going to go to the next league, they're not going to take it. They're going to take the game more selfish way because they got to get they got to get their money. But for me, putting down for college football, ultimately, I'd love to go to the NFL. I'd love to be the next Adam Thielen. I mean, that's my dream. But and you're going to play for the Jets, right? right? And you're going to play for the Jets. And you're going to play for the Jets. <laughs> I'll go wherever I'm wanted. There Absolutely. you go. That That's what I want to hear, my friend. That's what I want to hear. Maybe he'll be drafted <laughs> by the Vikings and play with Adam Thielen. <laughs> go ahead, Riley. I'm sorry to bother you. But, yeah, I'm ultimately going to go wherever I'm wanted, and that's why I'm here in Hawaii. So you were talking about the high school football, and you were talking about how you were from Texas. And Texas high school football is thought of as a, a second nature professional sport to them a lot of the time. Oh. They, they they think of it like they think of it more than their, the NBA and the MLB a lot of the time. The, the way the stadiums sell out, they play in these big stadiums. Yeah. So is oh. it is it everything that someone that isn't from Texas thought of? And oh. what were some of your experiences it with that? A, it is it is the holy grail of Texas. Let me tell you that. There's nothing like Texas high school football. It's like you said, it's its own professional sports. I mean, once you you look in the NFL and you see, oh, they grew up in Texas. I mean, those type of players stand out the most. You won't find any. They're a different breed of people. Now, I'm a different breed of per- people. <laughs> yeah. I'm from I'm from Long Island, <laughs> and Long Island football it might not be Texas football, but it's great football, my friend. I I, I just want to let you know that that Friday night light type of thing over here in Long Island is just as big over here as it is in Texas, my friend. So stop putting down. I know, mm. I know your Texas love is over there, but I, you have to give some, uh. you got to give New York love here, man. You got to give it. Uh, I, I'll have to see it myself and compare. I'll have to see it myself. Well, when you get drafted by the Giants anything, or the Jets. I don't know if there's anything that can beat Texas high school football. I'm telling you that right now. Well, when you get drafted by the Giants and Jets, we'll talk. How's that sound? Yeah, you know what? That, that sounds <laughs> awesome to me. I love them. We are talking to Hawaii football wide receiver and recruit Riley Wilson. Now, Riley, when I look at players and wide receivers in the NFL, we look at guys with speed and great hands. I don't care how tall you are. I don't care how mm-hmm. athletic you are. I care about your speed and your ability to catch the ball. When you look at your style of game and your the way you play the game, what is your strengths and what is your weaknesses? I would definitely say my strengths is my competitive nature. Me going up and getting the ball no matter what who's on me. I mean, when I play the game of football, I play with heart and passion. And ultimately, I'm going to destroy whoever wants to compete against me. That's my mindset, and that's what's got me here so far, and that's what's going to get me to the NFL. So I have no doubt in my mind who I'm going against because my ultimately mindset is that I'm going to beat them no matter what. You were talking now, about. I'd say my weaknesses mm-hmm. is uh, probably so I run a four two a four six two, which for college you know like you know you're a football guy yep. that's considered average. Mm-hmm. So definitely me and working with my strength trainer here that's the, that's my goal is just to get my forty down and just get that lateral speed back in my body. Well, speed has a lot to do with the NFL, and if you want to, oh, if you if you want to get into the draft and you want to be looked at mm-hmm. as a real profiled recruit or re, um, I'm sorry prospect prospect, um, 
I, I de- you definitely need to work on your speed. But I, again, yes, if you absolutely. have good if you have good hands and you can run good routes, uh, you're definitely mm-hmm. going to be looked at maybe in the sixth or fifth or fourth round. And like you yes. said, Adam Thielen, Adam Thielen was never drafted. Okay, so you yeah, you exactly. you're, you're talking about one of the best wide receivers in the NFL right now. That was a special teams mm-hmm. guy right. when he went to Minnesota. He was. He was drafted. I mean, he was brought in by Minnesota because he's from Minnesota. He was a hometown kid and really developed his skills more and more as he moved forward as an NFL player. And so, a, and he was a Division two football player. Yep. yep. So that's yeah, a, that's he was another. Division two. Yeah, he was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he took that adversity face on, and he pretty much showed why. You don't really need speed. Your hands can pretty much do the rest. And well, you're out running. Well, are you a dancer or are you not a dancer? I mean. I consider myself to be a dancer. I mean, I don't know if I'm good, but I'm going to bust down some, some moves. Well, do, do you know how to Dougie? <laughs> do I know how to Dougie? Do you know how to Dougie? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's pretty, but, you know, I got some good hits. So All right, so, the so, so if there is a season this year, okay, and your first touchdown. You want me to Dougie? I want your first touchdown dance to be a Dougie, okay? <laughs> And then I want you to okay. point. I want you to I, I point you. out. I got you. No, seriously, right. I got you. I'll do the Dougie. I'll I, do the Dougie. I, remember this now, man. I want to see will, the Dougie because if you score a touchdown, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch every single Hawaii game this year. If there right. is a season right. this year, and if right. Riley Wilson scores a touchdown, I better see a Dougie. You'll see a Dougie. You'll see me bust down the best Dougie ever. All right. All right. So I'm going to start practicing. I'm going to right after this call, I'm just going to look in the mirror and start Dougie to make sure I got it down. Well, just make sure you post it on social media so we can post it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just talking about Adam Thielen and, and the versatility now that you need to be a wide receiver in today's NFL. You have to be able to line up slot outside, a lot of different formations, a lot of different setups, even receivers mm-hmm. in the backfield. So – do you think this is a trend that will continue? And have you had experiences already at the high school level, maybe lining up in different places? And if so, what is the importance of everything and some of the differences with each type of uh, setup? I mean, definitely as you see the progression of football and the different type of formation, the different perspective offensive coordinators had, I think the game's going to adapt just solely on the athletes that the uh, and the personnel that the teams have. So, I think it's going to change throughout the years, and ultimately it's just going to matter of the type of people you have and the type of strengths and weaknesses they have, and that's going to be the type of formation that that offense is going to run. Riley, when you look at the NFL and and the way the game has changed with all the new rules and uh, you you have uh, the refs uh, calling the game because they have to look at every single play because uh, they're arguing points all because of the whole Saints situation with the Rams a couple of years ago in the playoffs in the NFC title game. And then you've seen Des Bryant score a touchdown and then completely get it taken away in the playoffs because he supposedly didn't have his feet down. Now, when you mm-hmm. look at the different rules of the game of college and you try to compare and contrast it to the NFL, what are the similarities that you see in both sports in, in, in two different games? I mean, the similarities I see is just, I mean, like, obviously the NFL has a lot of stuff in different rules. Just like you said with Des Bryant, that was, that was heartbreaking for me as a Cowboys That's why I said it. That's why I said it. <laughs> you tried to break my heart. You tried to That's break right. My heart That's what me. I'm trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> you, you made fun of my Jets, my friend. You made fun of my Jets. So now I am going to Come attack on, that, you in every kind of way. Nightmare. That is a nightmare for me right there. Gosh. Well, well yeah, let me just ask you. That, before, all right, you can agree with me that was definitely a catch. Oh, that was a catch. Absolutely a catch. Okay. They got robbed. Okay. Absolutely right. Yeah. But before you answer that question, I just I just want to ask you a question because we have a Cowboy fan over here who is a huge Cowboy fan. Now, I've asked Eric Coleman. We do an FM radio show out here in Long Island every Saturday. Me and Eric Coleman, ex-NFL player. He was a nine, nine-year vet in the NFL, played for the Jets, played for the Lions, played, the Atlanta, play, played for the Atlanta Falcons. I don't know if you know who he is, but I, I, I did ask him this question. And, and be honest, if Ezekiel Elliott – played behind the same offensive line as the great Barry Sanders in the 90s, do you think Ezekiel Elliott would be as explosive and as good as Barry Sanders? Ooh. 
Okay, let's see. The same line as Barry Sanders? Yes. I mean, I think Ezekiel Elliott's a fantastic running back. So Absolutely. I think regardless if he had the New York Jets O-line or the Cowboys O-line, oh, he'd still run for 1,200 yards. But would he have done it like Barry Sanders? Mm, I don't think so. No. Finally, I I, I was waiting because it... You're comparing him to a... I didn't compare him to nothing. I didn't say anything. It wasn't me. Not like Barry Sanders. No, I can't. No. All right. So, so finally, you have some kind of sense. There is a cowboy fan out there that has some kind of sense to him. I mean, for anybody to think that that Ezekiel Elliott would have played behind that bad offensive line and ran as many yards and as dominant as Barry Sanders was in the time that he was dominant, I think yep, anybody, yep. Uh, people would be on drugs even trying to compare them. And I love Ezekiel Elliott. I, I've yeah. been a Zeke Elliott fan since he played for Ohio State in high school football. Yeah. So I yep. know a lot about yep. Zeke. Know a lot. But yeah. go ahead. Answer, yeah. uh, answer the last question. I'm sorry. I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities between the NFL and the college the sports world, but the biggest difference is for in college, I mean, they got one more step to reach their ultimate goal. You know, I mean, they're trying to get that paycheck. So that's what I think it sets apart between the NFL and college. I mean, once you hit NFL, you've hit the, you've hit the top of the totem pole. You're getting your money. You've reached your ultimate goal growing up as a kid. You're, you're there. Now you just got to sustain that goal. Sustain your worth ethic, all that. For college, that is the ultimate grind between the NFL and the college. That's that's what I would have to say for that. Is there any particular opponent, both in your conference in the Mountain West and also across the college football landscape, maybe a big name team? Is there any opponent you're most looking forward to playing, and why? Well, if we have a season, I'd love to play Boise State. And just because they beat us last year, they beat us the year before that. Every time we've gone to the Mountain West Championship, they beat us. So it's it's our biggest rivalry, them. And whenever people think of Hawaii football, I mean, they're like, oh yeah, they're 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 all right, you know. They they they're they're at their own island. They don't really <laughs> they're not really that good of a team. But how about you play us? Yeah, I like your That's confidence. I, like I like your confidence, yeah, man, Riley. Riley, you know, if you actually came to Long Island and hung out with me, me and you would get along because I'm a very confident guy too. You know. That's good. You gotta have self confidence. Uh, I, I don't. You, that's what makes you in the world. Come on. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't. I still can't. When I was a kid, I could probably run a forty and four six. I can't even do that now. I'm 38 years old. <laughs> I'm in good shape. Don't get me wrong. I'm in very, very good shape. But I don't know if I can yeah. run a forty and four six, man. I, I'm not. I'm not 17 like you or 18 like you, and that can run like a deer, okay? But my yeah. question to you, when, when you look at the different styles of game and, and you look at it and you try to compare and contrast a player in the NFL to the way your style and the, your game, is there a particular player that stands out to you that you can compare your style of game to them? I would definitely say uh, Andre Hopkins just because – and Julio Jones – Julio Jones, too. I mean, yes, those two are – arguably, I think Andre Hopkins is the best receiver in the NFL. He is right now. Solely because – solely because of his competitiveness to get the ball. That's why I think it. His mindset is the same as mine, is you're going against me, I'm catching the ball, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. That's how I see – that's why I see him when he runs out the route. That's why I see him whenever they throw the jump balls to him in the end zone. He's catching the ball regardless of the situation. Are you that's sh- why I think. Are that's you? Why I think I'm just like him. He are, has the same mindset as me when I watch him play. Are you sure it's not because he's one of the best players in the league? Are you, come on, man. I, I don't know. No, no I don't no. know, Riley. You're you're starting to really <laughs> scare me now. You really are. No, no. I love the I, confidence. I so, I solely think it's because of his competitive nature. And if you look at if you listen to him, mic up, you, you you'll hear it. He literally says it word for word. I'm the best in the game. Well, I love his story. And if you know the story about his mom and her going blind Mm -hmm. when he was a kid and and really everything behind who he is as a person. And and he's a special player. I was very surprised that the Texans decided to trade him for a second and a fourth round draft pick. I was like, what is going on? Well, maybe because he was good friends with you, Riley, and they just wanted to get rid of him. 
<laughs> well, I wish he I played wish. for the Texans in Texas over there, right by yeah, your beloved Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> oh, I love my Cowboys. Come uh, on now. I know you do. Don't bring it up. I know you do. Maybe they wanted to put him closer to Hawaii to, to compensate for, for Riley going to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Speaking of Hawaii, Riley, uh, in terms of the very unique climate and geography of Hawaii, how do you think that will oh. affect the game of football as a whole in terms of for opposing teams and also for you guys training and playing in the game? Do you think yeah. it'll be something unique that is very different from the, from the continental U.S.? No, it's yeah, it's definitely unique. I mean, year round it's like eighty five, sunny. I mean, there's not even a cloud in the sky. It's it's paradise. Literally it's paradise. Every single day it gets better and better out here. But for the weather, I mean, I think it's definitely beneficial for us and it also has some negatives. For us, I mean, really we're gonna be practicing in the heat, getting in good shape, getting prepared, but whenever we gotta go play some Teams up north where it gets kind of cold, and we got that eight-hour flight. That's also another thing. Is every every game we gotta go to, we gotta we gotta haul. We gotta we got a nice flight ahead of us. So I think it's a good thing that we have this good weather, but it also can be a bad thing whenever we have to go pay, play some where cold because some of the locals here are not really used to that atmosphere, and they're not used to hitting, getting hit, or catching the ball when it's cold, playing in the rain. Some of those things don't happen here. It's not often that it rains here, so it's. It's very different, but it has a lot of positives, but a lot of negatives, too. We are talking to Hawaii football wide receiver recruit Riley Wilson, and definitely very soft-spoken Riley Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, well, Riley, when you look at the game of football, and I don't know if you played other sports in high school, were you, first of all, were you good at any other sport besides football in high school? Well, I'm, you're from Long Island, right? You yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, then you definitely know what lacrosse is. Of course I know, man. Now, lacrosse, yeah. lacrosse is, first of all, this is the homeland. Long Island is the homeland for lacrosse. Let's let's get it. Don't okay, get so it twisted it, it's over it's there, pretty, buddy. It's pretty, you say it's pretty big there, huh? It's huge. It's, it's huge yeah. over here. Mm-hmm. So imagine that times 10. That's how Texas high school football is. So let me get this straight. You didn't play any other sport besides football. I played lacrosse and basketball. And which, out of all the sports, which really stood out to you the most as far as your talent is concerned? What did you say you broke up there? I said which one stood out the most as far as your talent is concerned? Ooh, definitely football. Really? Out of all the sports? You, you just were speaking so highly of your lacrosse over there in Texas, and now all of a sudden you just kind of pitched it over there to football. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm trying to get you, man. I mean, you're going to be dugging. You better be dugging. Because if there is a season. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, already, I'm already dugging in right now. I'm already practicing. All right, 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 remember that because when, when you hear. Trust me, I'm boom, not forgetting boom. that. Every morning I'm awake, I'm like, hey, listen, I got to get my dougie down for that first touchdown. I got to get it down. <laughs> All right, I, I'm telling Don't you, man. Worry. That that that's gonna be the best doggy you've ever seen. Who's your roommate? I'm telling you. Who's your roommate? I got two roommates. Okay, who are they? Jake Farrell and Dayton Tony. And they're on your team, right? Yes, sir. Well, uh, two just... Texas boys and one from Arizona. Mm. So let me ask you this question: uh, What do you think they're going to be doing at night when you're trying to doggy? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to make them hold the camera so I can shoot it to y'all so y'all can post it. Well, And then I don't know what they'll be doing. Hopefully they're, high, they're doing the right thing. <laughs> Not, I hope they're, hopefully they're dug in with me. I'll make them dug you with me. Well, we know, you're from south, we know you're from down south in Texas because you say y'all. Y'all. We don't use that. <laughs> we don't use that over here in Long Island. So <laughs> yeah. we know you're southern, that's, man. That's, yeah, uh, that uh, that gives it away 100. percent I've I've been saying that down here, and they're like, "What is what is y'all?" And I'm like, "Oh, aloha." That's all I say. Because like, <laughs> all the Hawaii guests like, we have. That's better. Like, that's better. I'm like, yeah. That's well, we've been getting a lot of uh, Hawaiian guests. I think we've had three in the last like three weeks or something. We like had that. Uh, Maki from the M- from the UFC. Oh, I forgot about that. So it's four. We yeah. had we had the baseball coach. We mm-hmm. had. 
uh, we had a player, a baseball player that was from Hawaii who's in the Yankees organization. Mm. And now we have you wow. and, like you were saying, you had one on your MMA show too, I forgot about. Yeah. So we've Marky had four in the US last three yep. weeks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nuts. Wow. So, uh, Riley, what is your favorite route to run and what do you think is your best route? Oh, my favorite route to run is definitely a slow go. If you're familiar with that. Why is that? It is a it is a three yard slant. You show the slant and then stick your foot and then turn up field and it turns into a fade. So immediately the corner you're trying to make him bite the slant. Mm-hmm. You show your face, go three yards in, corner bites your hip, stick it, turn up field, touchdown. Well, speaking of bite, my friend, I mean, all you got to do is stick a hamburger in front of his face, and and then he'll <laughs> he'll make a bite. I mean, seriously, and then yeah, you'll beat oh, him to the outside. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, no, no. You'll be. I mean, it's in my film. You should watch it. It's my favorite favorite route to run. Well, well, so, f- I like to call it that. The slow go because it's an ankle breaker. Oh well, the your, dude's fall. Your favorite dance in the end zone is going to be the Dougie. So the Dougie, yeah, yes, gee, yeah. You, you know what I'm going to do for you? Dance. I'm going to create a dance for you because I am actually a dancer as well. I'm going to create a dance You're for a dancer. you. Yes, I I am a dancer. What's yes. your favorite move? I don't know, man. I, I used to break. I used to do a lot of different dances. I mean, uh, I could do the worm, whatever you want, but I don't think the worm would the be worm. good for you. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that for you. You know, the robot would be really good for you, man. I, I think that would oh, be really, robot. really funny. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got some good joints to do the, really? the robot. I can do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come, yeah. On, man. Come on, man. You just heard it, joints. I mean, I haven't heard that since, like, the 1980s, man. <laughs> He's asking you the back. question and describing it. I know, you're, man. He just said joints. Robot, you gotta keep it. You got to keep it stiff. You know, you got to be... You gotta be smooth with it. Oh, I got him. All My right, body's ready. I gotta, I gotta see this. I gotta see your robot. You better post that up on our social media, man. I better see this robot. <laughs> I mean, this Dougie, this robot. You tell your your roommates over there that I, I have to see this before you get on the field. I gotta give you some tips before you go on the field because I don't want you to embarrass me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you do. You do. I'll yes. I'm gonna I, need. I'm gonna need it. I, I do not want an any bar- embarrassment because if you're gonna you're gonna do that for me, I mean it can't oh, be an no, embarrassing thing. I'm sorry, I already told you it's gonna be the best Dougie anyone's ever seen. All right, I'm man. telling you, I'm gonna I do it pretty good. Run man. my slow go into the end zone, right. give the ball to the ref, say I'll be back, and then do my Dougie. Oh, you do oh you you do the I'll be back thing too. Oh, a little Terminator yeah. too. Oh, yeah. I like that, man. I like that. I like this kid. This kid's got some good personality. And he's, a, and, he's, and he's a robot, so now he's a cyborg, too, apparently, from that logic. Well, I'm you want a to cyborg. Da- you want him to dance the robot, he'll become the cyborg. I'm a cyborg, so we're, we're, we're a tag team right over here. We're just not in wrestling. There you go. <laughs> Maybe he'll give him ideas for that, too. No, no, no. no <laughs> Maybe he'll go to another sport. Uh, well, he, I, I, he just told you, football is life over there in Texas. So he doesn't want to play lacrosse. He doesn't even want to talk about basketball. We haven't even heard him talk about basketball, except that he played it oh, in basketball? high school. Yeah, basketball. Oh, I loved basketball. I was just too aggressive in it. Mm. That's my only problem with it. What are you throwing checks and throw hip some checks? Elbows. Mm. Go throw some elbows. I whenever they try to go up for a layup, I pretty much tackle them. Mm. Well, if the NFL doesn't work out for you, you could always go into the UFC. <laughs> Be the next Conor McGregor. Uh, oh boy! Don't bring that name up in front of him. <laughs> Do not bring that name up in front of me, man. Do not bring that name up in front of me, man. I mean, I've got my own differences to Conor McGregor. I've had my problems on social media to him and his team. Uh, we've had our differences. So, if you're going to mention a UFC fighter, do not bring up Conor McGregor of all people. I mean, that's just that's a smack in the face, buddy. I mean, seriously. But I love you, anyways, oh, Riley. You're great. great. You're great. As you guys know, we are talking Hawaii football wide receiver recruit Riley Wilson. Before we let you go, man, because uh, we we like to have some fun with different uh, guests that we have on the show. We're going to ask you five questions, okay? And we want Let's serious answers to this, okay? okay. So, all right, all right, here we go. First question is: boxers or boxers or briefs, and why? Boxers or briefs? Boxers? Are you kidding me? Why? Because, dude, you don't, you gotta, you gotta let them loose. <laughs> don't tell this guy over here. <laughs> dude, I mean, come on, you gotta, you got that, that, 
that is common sense there. I mean, that is common sense. I mean, no one wants you. Got to let them. Got to give them some air. There you go. I mean, I mean, I agree with you. You definitely need some air. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, but I, I, I'm, I'm more with the briefs kind of guy because I, I like them. You know, I like them stiff. You know. Yeah, yeah. You like, you like a. Like them snug. Yeah, snug, snug right there, man. I, you know, the sweating, <laughs> sweating in Hawaii in this humidity over here in Long Island is not good for them. So, you know, definitely got to wear <laughs> boxer briefs. Uh, number two, if you were to choose the the first car you bought, if you went into the NFL, what would be the first car you bought and why? Oh, this is an awesome question. Okay, so the first car I'm gonna get. Is definitely going to be a Lamborghini Aventador, and oh. just because it's hot and flashy, and it goes super fast, and I love going really, really fast. And mm. my mom, my mom's probably listening to this right now, and she's probably going to hate that, but she knows I love going really, really fast. Just make sure so, you're not trying to kill yourself, buddy. I mean, seriously. No, no, no. Mm-mm. No drinking in the driving. Just no, no, none of that. But I will tell you this: once I get that car. I'll be going freakishly fast, but mm. not not fast enough to kill myself. But fast. Women, blondes or brunettes, and why? Oh goodness! Well, my ex was a blonde, mm-hmm. so no blonde. My current girlfriend's a brunette, so I love brunettes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> she must be listening. <laughs> <laughs> Burnett all the way. Burnett all the way. All right. Question four. Favorite athlete growing up and why? Uh, favorite athlete growing up. Ooh. Let, let me, let me it's got to be a that. cowboy. <laughs> mm, let me see. I really liked, I still, mm, let me think. I liked Marion Barber. Probably don't know. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I really liked him growing up. Well, so hopefully you're better than him. Hopefully you're better than him, (laughs) (laughs) or have or have (laughs) even just better longevity than him. (laughs) Now, yeah, but now, what? Like Adam Thielen, like Mm -hmm. just based off the chip on his shoulder. You kind of look like him. You kind of look like him. Yeah, I get that a lot. You know. Mm -hmm. I know you love that. I know you love it. Yeah, it's it's always a compliment, but <laughs> just like, just like the way he was probably told, like, oh, you're going to a D two D two, like, there's no way, there's no way you'll you'll make it to the NFL, and like, kind of how he fueled his fire with that, and I, I really, I really admire that, how he really wanted to prove everyone wrong and saying, I can do this, I don't need, I don't need your acknowledgement, I can do it on my own. Mm. And just like me going through my high school experience and following his story, what he went through is just, it's just so like, it just pushes me to be like him. Mm. Question five. And it's cool. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Let's sorry. You were going to finish it? You're going to go ahead. No, you're good. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Question up, five. five. Yeah, question five. If we hung my partner over here to a tree, okay, of <laughs> and you, you had a chance to use him as a pinata, what would you hit him with? A bat or a tennis racket, and why? Ooh. Mm, a bat. Really? I think a tennis racket would hurt more. I really do. No, because of that, you could you could do some, you could do some moral damage. <laughs> moral damage. <laughs> I, wow. I would I would I would never I would never do that. Oh, no, uh, don't lie now. Don't lie, Riley. <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> no, I, would, I mean, if I had to, I'm going to use a bat. I mean, a tennis racket. That's not going to get anything done. <laughs> Well, it would hurt. That's more. like if someone if someone breaks into your house, what are you going to use a bat or a tennis racket? I don't know. It would be funnier using a tennis racket, don't you think? I mean, I do. I do see the humor in that. I mm-hmm. do seriously. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to go with the bat. I'm going to have to go with the bat. He's going for efficiency over style. I see. I see. Yeah. I got gotcha. you, Riley. Why don't you tell the fans how they can find you on social media? My Twitter is underscore Riley Wilson. And then my Instagram is underscore Riley Wilson with two ends. So y'all make sure to come give me show some love. We we all will, okay? 
We will. Thank you so much. Uh, but I, I will tell you this, Riley. I would love to get you back on the show. You're a great personality, and I'll tell you this. Seriously, I had so much fun. Well, I, thank you for having me. Oh, I, love, I love, I love y'all. And thank you for the love and support. It really means a lot. Listen, listen. I want to, I want to see Dougie, man. I want to see that Dougie. Okay, so oh no, I'm, I I'm, I gave you my word. All, all right, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking that word. I'm, I'm, if you don't have that touchdown I'm dance, I'm it. calling you, buddy. I'm sending no, you a text. I'm, I'm doing the Dougie. Right. Like I promise you, right. my first touchdown will be a Dougie. I'll be watching every single Hawaii game until you get that you, first touchdown. Good, good, good. And when you're that, gonna see, you're going to see the best Dougie. And I give you my word. To all that. right, and I want, and when you do that, I want you to point out to the audience and give me the. Give me the L sign, okay? Just put L for, like, L. loser, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean Long yeah. Island. Long Island. That sounds better. Yeah. L for Long Island. Yeah. Social media might not trust for that, right? L for Long Island. But it, I, I would love to get you back on the show uh, when the season Absolutely. does start. We would love to talk yeah. a little football with you. And when you do get drafted, yeah. make sure you invite us to your draft party, my friend. Oh, my, I'm going to have the best draft party ever. Well, I'm invited. You know, I'm Nobody inviting myself. Invited, trust me. I am inviting I think myself. Into the first things. Well, I, I'll bring that. my first talk, so. Well, there you I'll go. Definitely be there. There we go. You know what we're going to do? We're going to bring Speedy, my partner over here. We're going to hang him on top of a pole in Texas or wherever. Well, it, and I'm going to use a bat. There you go. There you go. I'll bring and the bat, too. You wear, and I'm making you wear boxers. There you go. I, I, I He'll wear boxers. And, and I'm going to hand you the mic, and you have to say, I love the Cowboys. So no, much. no, 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 that doesn't happen. But I, I don't hate the Cowboys. <laughs> I don't hate the Cowboys. I'm a Giants fan, so I had to wear a, a Tony Romo jersey on air when I lost a bet with our crazy Cowboy fan we were referring to that says Zeke could run on oh. Barry Sanders' offensive line. Mm. It was so painful for me to endure psychologically oh. having to put that oh. that jersey on. I wish I could have saw that. I wish I could have saw that. It's 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 somewhere on our social media from two years ago. I'll send it to you, Riley. Don't worry about it. <laughs> After you investigate yeah, the show it. from like twenty eighteen. Absolutely, man. Riley, follow us. We will stay in touch. Thank you for joining us. Thank we really you. appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank Absolutely. So for having me. Absolutely. Tell your family that they raised a good kid. Thank you. I will. I'm sure they're listening right now. Hawkeye me. Well, well, you're a Hawkeye. No, you're not a Hawkeye. You're a Hawaiian. What do they call themselves? <laughs> the Rainbow Warriors. What, what kind of team the Rainbow names? Rainbow Warriors. Which is a great name, that and you must embrace name. it. That is a terrible name. The embrace Rainbow it. Warriors? I mean, come on. Just call yourself the Warriors. The Rainbow it, it, Warriors? It's culture. It's culture. Oh, it's that's culture. Right. You tell them. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of the guy that's wearing lace right next to me. Yes, I had to stand by the Rainbow Warriors. Oh, you are a pain in my ass, man. <laughs> I got you, Riley. Don't worry. Uh, Thanks, up. Riley. Appreciate it. Thank y'all so much. Y'all have a good night. You too. You too. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Riley Wilson, ladies and gentlemen, Hawaiian re- football recruit, uh, gave us some good insight, had a lot of fun with him. Definitely can listen to the replay of the show. Speedy will probably post it all over the world. So definitely stay tuned for that. Yeah, and 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 apparently overseas, we're we're going to Hawaii. Oh, we're getting this feed into Hawaii too for there all the go. all the Hawaiian football fans, the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors. Oh God. <laughs> Anyways, when we come back, we're going to have another football player, but an ex NFL football player, former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Briggs here on Below the Mic. You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Six three one nine six five four nine nine zero is the number. This is below the mic. We are live every single Thursday from six p.m. to eight p.m. New York Eastern Time. Go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. I want to give a shout out to Riley Wilson. Gave us some good insight of Hawaii. We had a lot of fun with Riley. And this guest, uh, I was very excited when I heard we were going to interview him. We are now talking to former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Dy- Briggs. What's up, Dyrell? Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing, man? How you doing? Well, well, how am I doing? Well, I just told you when we were coming back from break that I, I'd rather be under my uh, my table right now because of everything that's going on with this <laughs> crazy stuff that's going on in the world, man. I, I just, it's just everything with the Washington Redskins now. I mean, there's just every single thing. I mean, it, maybe God's trying to tell us something. I, I don't know what the hell he's trying to tell us, but he's telling us something. 
Man, no, I, I, I agree with you, man. I think I think somebody's trying to tell us something. I tell you that. Mm, well, I'll tell you this right now. Maybe you should send your Super Bowl ring to me, and that will be telling you and telling everybody that I am now the Super Bowl champion. Not you, I am. How's that sound? Um, man, you know what? That, that, that probably, I, you know what? What I'll do is I'll get a copy of the original uh, one and I'll send you one. How about that? Well, well tell, uh, tell Aaron to do the same because I, I would really like Aaron Rodgers' ring, not yours, because Aaron Rodgers is the superstar quarterback. But we'll get into that a little bit later on this, uh, on this interview. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Hey, I'm, hey, you know what? I'm not mad at you, man. I, hey, I, I, hey, if I had a chance right now, I still want to hook up with him right now just to, you know, talk to the stuff and, you know, shoot the game. Well, I'll tell you this. My, I have a lot of love for you, so don't worry about that. And trust me, by the end of this interview, you will know how much love I have for you. <laughs> awesome. All right, all right. Anyways, uh, before we get into the interview, how are you and your family doing with this pandemic? Um, honestly, it's, it's, at first it, it was kind of tough, you know, being that, you know, taking away all the opportunity of, of going outside and, and being in the public with others. Um, and honestly, it helped out. It actually worked out well with me because my kids are, I'm in Arizona right now and my kids live in um, Michigan. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, when this, um, this whole thing happened, I was able to get them here and, and it's kind of been just most of focus on family time because I'm a teacher. So with school and everything that was out, you know, it just gave me an opportunity to be more hands on family time, you know, and, and, and just kind of build them foundations, you know, and, and, and core values once again. And, and, and really realize what's important in family. So it's, it's been pretty good, man. But it's, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I'm going be honest. It's been a headache, man. <laughs> kids, <but laughs> I'm going to be honest, man. I'm not going to say it like it's, it's all sweet, man. But, you know, the kids, it's driving me up a storm, man. I mean, up this wall, man. I'm telling you, man. Other than that, man, we, we, we've been pretty blessed for the most part. Well, thank God I don't have any kids, Dyrell, because I'd be running for uh... – <laughs> I'll be running for something, man. Definitely, I'll be hiding behind six or seven tables before any of that. I'm serious. Anyways, <laughs> we are talking to former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Briggs. Now, Dyrell, I, I look at the NFL, and I, I it's changed from when you played. And you were drafted – well, you were undrafted and signed by the San Francisco 49ers, and then uh, eventually you played for the Green Bay Packers. But – Tell us a little bit about your your, your college career and con, con, really kind of tra- transitioning into the NFL, uh, being picked up by the San Francisco 49ers, and then eventually getting traded or signing with the Green Bay Packers. Well, um, first of all, it was definitely a blessing to play for, you know, every team, you know, in the NFL that I played with. Uh, but um, the transition, it was, it was actually – Something that I, I, I didn't even think that I was had an opportunity to to, to actually go to the NFL at the time. In, the, in the, when I was in college, I was at Bowling Green State University, a small you know small D one Mac school at the time, um, and and I was playing DN. And when you think of a defensive end, you know heading to the NFL, he's he's six four, six five, like. 260 and above almost, you know, and me coming out of the, um, college, I was only, you know, scratching 230 at the most. So, and, but it was grateful. It was really great for me because at the time, a lot of teams was transitioning into that three, four defense, you know, they were loving the, you know, the, the, um, how would you call it? The hybrid, mm-hmm. which is the outside linebacker that can rush and that could drop. You know, so, and at the time, you know, I could probably say at the time I was one of the most, i say athletic guys, the most athletic guys on our team that could be able to do both coming out of college. Um, so I think a lot of teams seen that. And um, so when, um, at the time doing the whole draft, I had Miami come out and check me out. And they told me at the time, I remind them of, you know, I think it was Joy Porter who they had, and they was like, man, we can, we can really use you, you know, playing in a 3-4, standing up. We love your, your versatility that you're able to drop back and be able to, you know, coverage, but you're also able to get to the quarterback. And I'm like, yeah, you know, love it. So I spent time with them, you know, 
thinking that, you know, I was going to get drafted the fifth or fourth round, you know, by Miami at the time. You know, they're going to talk to almost everybody I've known. From my from my elementary teacher to almost you know some neighbors that knew me growing up, so I'm thinking at the time you know I'm going to Miami. Um, I came out to the draft and um, I actually wasn't picked. You know Miami looked, you know they they didn't pick. They used the pick on someone else. And um, right after the draft, you know um, I got several calls from different teams to come. You know work out, I mean, basically become, you know, an extra body at the time and see if you could make the team. And um, at the time, me and my agent, we just sat back and looked at everything that we had, you know, and seen, and try to see what was going to be the best fit for me to get an opportunity to show my talent. And um, that's where, you know, I ended up with San Fran. And, so, um, go ahead. I'm going. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, just – just being with San Fran, you know, I was out there um, first year. Um, I was out there around some great guys. You know, I, I tell people that's one of the most talented team I've, I've, I've ever seen. You know, I was out there with Vernon Davis, Patrick Willis, um, Frank Gore, Michael Crabtree, um, uh, Brian Westbrook. At the, I mean, you know, at the time um, we had uh, who else? We had we had Justin Smith, Tequil Spice. You know, we had some good guys. Alex Smith. You know. Um, we had some good guys, man. I was, I was playing around some, some great guys. And um, I seen, you know, how we developed and I played, you know, came in that first year, um, thinking that, you know, honestly, everybody around me, that free agents don't make the team. You know, we had I had a, a cage for my locker, you know, just one of them. It was like temporary, like, you know, you're not, you know, not going to make it. But I made the first cut. You know, I was grateful to make the second cut. Then I made that 53 to make the squad. And it was just like, you know, it was a dream come true. You know, coming from a small school, um, actually not being drafted and then getting onto a, a, a team and then actually making a 53-man roster, it was a, it was, it was a blessing, you know. Um, and after I made it, it was a numbers game, and I ended up getting on the practice squad for that year. But it gave me a chance to develop, you know. And as I talked to Mike Singletary, it brought me in and told me, you know, he was like, you know, you can be something great, man, if, if you just put your mind to it and, and, and build your foundation strong, you know. So as a kid, you know, at that time, you know, I really didn't understand what he meant with about my foundation, but he was just basically telling me, you know, everything outside of you has to be stable in order for you to become the best NFL player possible. Because it takes a lot out of you. The NFL, it, it takes everything from you, you know, if you want to be great at it. So, you know, at the time I came back, and um, the next year, and I, I, I was really running it. You know, I thought I, I had a great camp coming up, um, had a, a few great, you know, um, preseason games and made the squad, and it was looking great and um, made the team. But um, once again, it was a numbers thing. I ended up getting um, – waived to be on the practice squad, but at the time I didn't understand what they were trying to do. But now I sit back in hindsight. Um, I see what they were trying to do. They were basically trying to save me um, because they had, you know, some old veteran guys that was kind of on their way out, you know, um, Paris, Harrison and, you know, Manny Lawson at the time, you know, and, and me being up with I'm like, no, 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 I want to play. You know, I think I'm good enough. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. That's when uh, – during that time, me and my agent ended up deciding to go to Denver. So I got to be out there in Denver making roster money, but, you know, I had to transition and start all over again. I was there for four weeks um, on their practice squad, um, got the chance to play against, um, play alongside and, you know, see the work after the um, Tim Tebow. Um, when, honestly, I want to say that's one of the hardest working guys I've ever seen. Um, and then um, during that time, I was on that – that um the, the practice squad Green Bay um gave me a call was like hey we we see that you you're available and we've been we kind of been looking at you and I you we'd love to um, add you to our team you know we got a lot of injuries and we'd definitely be honored to have you come you know mm-hmm. so I'm down with them and honestly man um it was one of the best experience ever um just the atmosphere the people I was around you know just walking into you know don't get me wrong San Francisco had their you know had their dynasty and just had that transition of championship. But it was just a little bit something different when I walked into that, that, that Lambo, you know, Green Bay, you know, it was just, it was just totally different. And, uh, and that was kind of like all she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> so the Packers again, in throughout Aaron Rodgers, ten, you know, a lot of people 
defend him because a lot of the times the defenses aren't good. But in that Super Bowl team, that defense was good, especially in that front seven. You play with a lot of talented linebackers, Nick Barnett, A.J. Hawk, Clay Matthews, guys like that. You had Charles Woodson at corner. What were some of the what were what was it like playing with those teammates? What are some of the experiences you've had? Maybe some some crazy stories with the with that defensive core that they had. Well, the, the, well, to be honest, a lot of people may know or may not know at the time. Our defense was, I mean, number one in turnover um, for TDs. I think we had like twenty seven turnovers, and, and 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 I think most of them were for TDs. And when you think about that, you know, that's touchdowns. That's not really you know accounted for. And 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 also, we were one of the top ranked special teams too. Because, you know, and I played mostly special teams. I was Clay Bucks backup, you know. So, but if you were a backup, which were number two, you know, you had to bring in your, pull in your weight on that special teams, you know, because special teams, and I want people to know this, special teams is probably one of the hardest plays um, almost in the NFL, you know, because it's full of speed. And some of these guys, this is the only, you know, chance they get to play in their opportunities, and it's just full tilt. So, you know, our coaches tell us if you can play special teams, then you can make a play on special teams, you can make a play on offensive defense. So, but to, to go back to my point with that, you know, our first team was so great because we believed in A-Rod. You know, it, we felt like that, you know, we're not, we felt like we knew that if we made a play or put our team in the best position, or uh, get the ball back to A. Rod, he would do something special. And I, and honestly, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, he did. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and and how and, and the reason he got that respect and the love is because that goes back to just like you were saying, just the talent that we were with. You know, the guys that we were with. You know, Donald Drivers, great guy. You know, that was like that was my actually locker. You know, roommate right there. You know, and we used to kid. You know, I had. Jordy Nelson next to me, Greg Jennings. And the atmosphere was just, um, it was family environment. Nobody was above anyone, you know, like Aaron Rodgers. I'll give you an example. Like I said, we were going through camp, and um, during the time, a lot of teams either go to, you know, during camp, you go to a spot where it's just, you're in the dorm or you're in a hotel where it's just all the team, you know, it's just, it's just like being back in high school and, you know, doing camp almost where you just, you know, with the team, you eat, sleep, wake up with the team, college, you know? So we did that. We were in the dorm and, and at the time we have lunch and, you know, the rookies uh, go, you know, eat last. So, you know, that'd be the last one to eat. So during that time when the rookies was eating and Rogers was set up, <laughs> He was set up his little, you know, his little, his little, I think it was a BB gun, a pellet gun, and he had hide. And, and as the kids and as the rookies were coming back, he would sit back and shoot them. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, you know, little stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? Just to, just to lighten up the mood. And, you know, he was just that type of guy. He was that type of guy to just make you feel like, you know, you he, he wasn't no bigger than the team and you and you was part of it, you know, and I give you another example is when I first got there, um, I was number two, I was on the defensive, um I was on number two defense going to get to number one O. Oh, and um like I said, I was I felt like, you know, I was a great pass rusher. You know, I used to get to the quarterback and when I used to get to him and tag him, it'd be, you know, after that, you know, that, that little session to be over, he'd come to me and he'd be like, man, Brad, I love, I love the work, man. Keep working. You got me on my heels, man. You, you making me, you know, better. And to me, that, that, that shows a lot about a, a leader. That shows a leader. That shows um, a character about a man. That's, that, that's allowing me, one, to give me confidence that I'm doing my job, and two, that, you know, he appreciates that. And, and, and what that does, that builds great chemistry, man, and that builds a great team. And that's what we end up having, man, and a great bond, man. And it was just like, you know, after that, it was just like, boom, like, all right, well, I got to get A-Rod the ball. Like, this is my boy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, even though he was a quarterback and I'm a linebacker, that was my boy. You know, we was going to ride or die for A-Rod. So, and, you know, and that was kind of, you know, that was just kind of atmosphere. We are talking to former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Briggs. Now, Dyrell, there has been stories coming out of Green Bay over the last couple of years about Aaron Rodgers, how he's controlling how he is the leader of the team, but he is the center of attention. He's always wanted to be the center of attention to the team. Jermichael Finley came out a couple of years ago stating that uh, he wanted out of the organization because he couldn't deal with Aaron Rodgers. Greg Jennings said it on a bunch of radio shows. 
Did you see any of that when you were playing for the team? And if you did, what did you see? And really, what was the turnoff of why everybody, well, these guys didn't like Aaron Rodgers? Uh, to be completely honest, I I, was, I could only see what I seen because mm-hmm. I was on the defense event, mm-hmm. you know, being a um, being a linebacker. But you know, I I kind of I could kind of relate. If anything, what I've seen out of Aaron Rodgers is one that he had a chip on his shoulder, you know. Um, so he he kind of reminded me of after seeing the last dance. Is, the last dance is he kind of had that Jordan mentality that mm-hmm. anything was necessary that he, he needed to win. He wanted to win and he knew how to win and and, and he, he, he just that's how he went, you know. So to me, honestly, um when it comes to the offensive guys, it's probably like I said, the meeting rooms is totally different from right. defense. We split up and go into our, you know, our team defense and then you go into your individuals. So, you know, I really got the chance to really be in there and see that vibe. But for the most part, just by, you know, being there for them a few years, I mean for that year and too, and watching A-Rod, I felt for the most part he just wanted to win, and the way we, we worked the ball and threw the ball, I felt like he, he shared it enough. I felt like we had, like, James Jones, you know, got tickets, you know, Crabby got, you know, a chance to catch the rock, you know, it was a lot of guys I felt like touched the ball during the time I was there, that to say that Aaron Rodgers is kind of like this type of guy, I mean, he could be the, some people, but from my point of view, I just felt like he wanted to win and he he had the pedigree and he and he had the mindset and and, and you know from the, my point of view from my point of view I respect that and that's kind of what I I could say but other than that I say personally from my experience he was a great guy I mean he always made like I said he made a guy that like me on defense that was rushing you know coming close to him you know slapping putting heat on him he made me feel like I was part of the team and that I was a big key in the team and to me like I said that plays a major part in any success team or any company, you know. So the the playoff run you guys were on was absolutely tremendous as a six seed, the last wild card team to win the Super Bowl uh, when you did it, and knocked off some very good teams. The Eagles, who I thought was going to go to the Super Bowl that year, they beat the Steelers in the Super Bowl, who were a very talented team. What were some of your favorite moments and experiences just from all those games, all four of those games of that playoff run? No, let me. It's crazy that you say that because a lot of people don't remember. We were like, uh, we were like, we was a wild card. So every game, I'm going to tell you like this, this came up to the game against New York. We were at home. And the coach came to us. He said, look, he said, guys, if we want any type of chance to go, or he would get a wild card to even sniff the playoffs, we have to win this game. But we know that if we win this game, every game from here on out is a playoff game. You know, so that was the mindset, you know. So when we went out there and it was freezing, I remember it was like yesterday, we were freezing. We go out there and we played New York. And um, I think, um, actually, I think, matter of fact, um, Little Wayne was there. Little Wayne had came down because he's a uh, big fan of us. Came to the game and whatnot. It was just a big game. And we ended up winning the game. And, and, and that day, after that game, we had that, we just had that aura. We had that, how should I say? Swag. That, that, that swag that we knew, like, hey, we on the road now. Here we go. So we're from New York, and I think um, I don't think who, who the next team was. I think it was it was um, either it was Philly. One game, I give you probably each one of my best moments out of each game. That moment out of that game is when I, I want to say um, my boy Terrell T. Williams got that interception. Oh, it was one of the most prettiest interceptions thrown in the um it's in the end zone he's falling backwards and he's when he caught it i think it was going to cooper i believe for the eagles i don't know what receiver was going to but if they would have caught it they would have probably won the game but that was a great interception by him if you guys would look it up i mean it was perfect it was just i can just diving back you know just floating in the air and it was just like boom it was money after that game i think we went to um I think it was, I want to say Atlanta, and I think two weeks prior, Atlanta had whooped us, and they were talking smack, you know, and they were saying a lot of things and saying, oh, this is going to be easy. I remember what you guys did to them. I remember what you guys did to them. Oh, man, so so I'm going to tell you one of my uh, memories from that is it was right before halftime, and I think T-Dub again, he got a pick, took it to the house. 
And next thing you know, we were up by 21. And we like, here we go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the money in the bank, man. And then, um, and then my la- I think well, I want to say the next one, if I'm counting right, is, um, it was Chicago. We went to Chi-Town. It was, mm-hmm. it was pretty it was pretty exciting to me because I got the chance to play against my cousin. A lot of people know Lance Briggs is my cousin, mm-hmm. you know, so. I got a chance to play against Lance Briggs, and one of the best moments of my life was sitting boy B.J. Raji, which that was kind of my close guy on the team. B.J. Raji, he's picking up, I mean, getting a, uh, the interception and doing a Raji dance, you know, and right then and there, man, after that, you know, it was just like we there, you know, dream come true. And, um, uh, and, and I guess the most memorable part of the night before the Super Bowl, and a lot of people probably didn't tell you, but we got our fingers, our, our, our fingers measured. And you know, to be honest, a lot of teams don't do that until after you won. So they kind of tell you where our minds that were. <laughs> And uh, man, you know, and, and that kind of that kind of set the bar. And then next thing you know, we get there, and, and it was pretty sweet because what made us feel even more comfortable was one that it snowed down there, so we felt like we brought some snow down there. <laughs> you know, in Texas, it don't snow in Texas. You know, and so we come from Wisconsin. We like, okay, there goes one. You know, that's that's one sign. And then everybody in Texas was just like, let's go, we play. You know, and then, you know, another thing was that we was the underdogs too, because a lot of people were saying with Ben and other guys having an experience, Super Bowl experience that, you know, nobody on our team had, you know, and it was like, uh, you know, we got six guys, eight guys on injury reserve, and then not only that, it's a guy that's starting as Mac players. Like, we had a lot of guys that was, like, from small Division ones. that was guys that, you know, that was just, that, that, that wasn't heard of, but, mm-hmm. you know, we worked well as a team, and we were good, you know, we, we were just like them, the underdogs, point mm-hmm. like this. You know, and um, you know, so we had already came in, like you said, with that swagger, and then we went in there. You know, my boy Nick got the pit. Oh my God, man! And then it it it, it was just on. Oh. You know, A Rob was on fire. You know, you know, it was a great game, and then you know, then our boy, then my boy Clay Matthews, the most probably best play ever during that time is when he made. Um, I forgot the running back name. He made him fumble. We picked it up, and that was kind of like the deal. <laughs> I think it was Rashard Mendenhall. Man. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mendenhall. Yep. That was him. <laughs> and, uh... That was him. That was him. That was him. We are talking to the former. We're, we are talking to former Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Briggs. Now, Dyrell. Uh, when you look at the NFL now, and the game has transitioned, and you look at all these personalities, Odell Beckham. Uh, you have Le'Veon Bell. I'm just talking about guys that were in New York. There are tons of them. You have Russell Wilson. You have Cam Newton. Does there is there any player that stands out to you that you can compare and contrast to some of the players you played with in the NFL? Oh, let me see. Honestly, um, it'd be. You, you might, a lot of people might not believe me, but I, it's so hard for me to kind of watch football anymore. So I barely watch the NFL. But if I had to say a player recently that I felt like that was close, would probably be honestly Von Miller. Von Miller, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love his, I love his personality. But you know what? The way he plays on the field, mm-hmm. which is. It's that Ron Miller and, and you know, Khalil Mack, you know. Yeah. I, I, maybe I, it's probably because I'm a, I'm honestly a defensive player and I'm naming these linebackers, these pass rushers. But, I mean, honestly, um, I would say just from that game, that, that's kind of the two guys that I, I kind of love to watch. Absolutely. One of the you played for one of the most unique defensive coordinators in Don Caper is a guy that would drop defensive linemen back all the time. He blitz he blitz defensive backs and dropped drop Big J Raji like you were saying got a pick six of the Super Bowl. Very crazy scheme that he that he worked with. That used used the depth a lot. What was it like playing for him? And what are some of the things that he really taught you when he when he was your defensive coordinator? Well, Don, well I'm, I must say that he, he he's a brilliant man. He was a brilliant man, and to honestly, you know, to get to know his scheme, you had to really become a great player. You had to become a student of the game, and that's what we focus on. That's what, you know, my basically my position coach, Kevin Green. Shout out to my boy Kevin Green, one of the best coaches I had. 
um, also a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. um, but she, the, the whole game plan was to learn how to become a, a better player, you know, uh, and learn to become a student of the game. The more you know that everybody's positioned, the better you become in that defense. So our defense was pretty, you would say complex, but it, it, if you learned the game and you know your God's position, it just made it ten times better. So a lot of things that we can call on the run made it not easy because everybody knew everybody's position. You know, and, and sometimes that can be tough trying to get everybody to know everybody's position, you know, being that everybody doesn't learn the same way and this and what. But, you know, that's what our, you know, that's what his mindset was. And, and by doing that, you know, it took a lot of time took a lot of repetition, you know, and you wanted the, the best out of you. There was no days where we took kind of days off. Practice was always full tip, you know. You know, it's practice how you play. You know, if you if you go in our thing with learning violent nature again, you know, so playing up to him, it just made me a, a, a better player and a better student of the game. You know, I wasn't just able to be a pass rush. I, I knew defenses. I knew the different coverages where, you know, why – when we run a four three, where the corner would be without even knowing, you know. So it just made me a better student of the game. Dyrell, when I when when I ask players this, and I ask you know recruits or playing college football, even NFL players or ex NFL players, uh, I do a show here on an FM dial with Eric Coleman. He played in the NFL. Uh, you know who Eric is. He played for the Jets. He played for the Lions, and he played for the Atlanta Falcons for nine years in the NFL. And I, I've asked him this question. Is there a particular player that stood out to you and uh, as far as a comedian, a guy that made you laugh all the time, if it wasn't on your team, another team, that really just stood out to you when you played in the NFL, and do you have a story behind it? Uh, <laughs> let me see. Let me think. Who did I talk to was pretty hilarious? Uh, uh, I, can't, I, I can't think of his name. Um, he was a cornerback um, for San Francisco, um, and he played for Pitt. Um, but he was a little bit older than me. I can't think of his name, but he looked like Eddie Murphy. <laughs> and he was very, I mean, when you're talking about funny, I mean, he was, I mean, he, he was, he had you dying laughing. I mean, it's just, <laughs> This joke, it, 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 he'd say something like, "Man, you know, you know what I'm saying." He'd be like, "Man, somebody put something in his mouth because my zipper jam." You know, just, <laughs> just, you know, just funny. Like if somebody's talking smack, man, just I mean, he, he was just one of them guys that that it was just natural for him. And like you said, and when I say he looked dead on Eddie Murphy, he did. I can't think of his name. He was actually, um, I wanted to, he was he did pretty good, you know, stuff he had. Um, We're actually looking him up uh, right now. We're actually looking him up right now. We're trying to find who it is. Um, I can't. <laughs> Wait, oh, he's from Pittsburgh. He's around the time that came out. Shantae Spencer. Yes, Spencer, yep. I recognize the name now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about funny, hey, funny. I mean, he was so funny that he was actually writing up skits during the time he was playing in the NFL. I used to come to his room, and he used to show me little skits that was hilarious, you know. And, you know, and shout out to him. I hope he's still doing some great things, man, uh, with that. But he was really, he was funny, man. He was definitely hilarious. Older guy, and like I said, he, he, he had everybody die, you know. All right, so this is a two-part question from one of our fans that is a big Chicago Bears fan. His name is Carl. He's from Chicago, lives in Tampa. Tell him I'll buy him a beer. Uh, I'll buy him a six-pack if he can if he can name the backup quarterback that came in for the Bears when Cutler got hurt. I know this one too. You tell you asked me. Yes, yeah. he wanted he wanted me to ask you who was the backup quarterback that came in for Cutler when he got hurt in that game. Hey, to be completely honest, <laughs> I have no damn clue. I actually remember it for some strange reason. Who is it? It is Caleb Haney. <laughs> you, Caleb who? Caleb Haney was his name. I remember that for some strange reason. I think that was I think that was only the, one of the two games he played in the NFL. <laughs> it was in the NFC Championship <laughs> game. You you know what? You, it's so crazy that I, I really didn't remember the game because everybody was so shocked that Cutler went out that game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every, I mean, everybody was so shocked because we was like, 
I mean, he wasn't. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to talk about that man his injury, but you know, I, that's funny. I did not. I really don't. I didn't. I did not know that was that backup. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bud. You probably, a lot of people don't even remember me, so it's okay, man. It's okay. It's okay. Bro. He also wants to know your thoughts on Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers, as in, is, is he a good player? Or? He's a good player. What did you think as a teammate? Really, what did you think of him as an NFL player? I actually think um, right now with how the NFL is transitioning, I think he he could be a great player. Um, his energy, you know, once again, um, I think, and make it a great company. It's like, like you guys, you know, everybody has to play a part in, 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 and everybody is unique. If they have some talent to bring to the table, that could just make the team and that makes the company 10 times better. And I feel like him with this energy and him being very versatile to play a lot of positions, I think he, he, he he's he's a spark that could be something that you need. Once again, that's the type of guy that could be played on special teams. And we and, and I want people to know how important special teams is. It, it could be a game changer. You get a block punt, put you in great field position. You get a kickoff return. You get somebody, you stop somebody down in the 20. That's all. You know, that's the all game changing difference, you know. So, with him, I think he's a great spark, man. I, I like watching him play, you know. So, you know, to me, that's just my personal personal opinion. But once again, once again, the game is totally different. Do I think he probably, um, what did he probably play back then? I don't know. Um, but right now, I think he's a great, great fit for the NFL. All right, so you played when you were with the Packers under Coach Mike McCarthy, and now he's in Dallas. And I have a host next to me oh, who does God. not think he will succeed in Dallas. Nope. So, so one, what was your what were your yeah. thoughts of playing for McCarthy when you were in Green Bay? And two, how do you think he will improve the Dallas no, Cowboys? No, before you answer, or that, if Ty- Tyrell, before you answer this, this I'm not saying that Mike McCarthy isn't a good coach. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying about Mike McCarthy is. His style of offense does not fit the the Dallas Cowboys. When you look at your best player to be a power back, there is not one power back that really succeeded in, a, in almost 12 seasons as a head coach in a West Coast offense that Mike McCarthy really product, productively brought to that Green Bay Packer team. So that's the only reason why I said it's not going to work. Not because I don't think Mike McCarthy is a good coach. I just don't think he's going to fit with the Cowboys. Hmm. Now, so my thoughts on it. So, I, you know, to be honest, um, I totally. Well, this is how I can look at it. When you look at when he was at Green Bay, your focus wasn't really on trying to find one of the best running backs to run, run. You know, to run your style of running back offense. So, if you was a good running back and you got placed there, you kind of had to just sit back and kind of watch a Rod and just be there, blanket for a Rod. You know. Mm-hmm. So, and what I felt like was. McCarthy, he was a coach that you kind of say he was a player coach. You know, he he said what he said, he meant what he meant, but he was able to have that understanding. And you know, and honestly, I love the office that we ran at Green Bay because the the office that we ran at Green Bay, I believe that office coordinator ended up going to Miami. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of things had kind of went different there. So when we say putting him over at Dallas, what I feel like he's a brain to Dallas is that more, I want to say that more, for one, that, that camp, that chemistry of championships, like everybody buying in. Because once again, that's what I said that was unique for for me when I went to Green Bay compared to when I was in Denver and compared to when I was in San Fran. Because I tell you this, when I was in San Fran, it was the most talented team I've ever been on, and that was the same year I was with Green Bay. And you see what San Fran did the next following year. They ended up going to Super Bowl. So mm-hmm. that kind of tell you what type of talent that they had. But when I went to Green Bay, it was more of, okay, it's family. Let's get everybody to key in, figure out what system works for us and what suits us, and let's roll with it. And if you buy buying in, let's go. So what I think he'll do over there is be like, hey, our horse is this running back. Let's figure out a way to be able to feed him and then let everything else open up. That's what I think he'll do as a great head coach. But first and foremost, get everybody to buy in. You know, I think um, it, it's hard when you think about you got a bunch of uh, grown men that's getting paid, you know, some good money, you know, to, to really focus on trying to do everything and be selfless to get to this one goal. That was our thing. One mile, one heart, one purpose. 
You get everybody getting on that one heartbeat. Everything is possible. No, nobody to care about. You know, things will open up. You know, the run game and everything will open up and such and such, you know. But I feel like, like you said, go back to answer your question, him being in Dallas, it could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. You know, I think um, if he's able to be the coach that I know he'd be, he'd get there, get that chemistry together, and ride with this and that and that'd be the running back. You have, know, you, have you have uh, you have you reached out to any players from your old team, the Green Bay Packers, when they won the Super Bowl? Is there any players that you you still keep in contact of? Um, I still keep in contact with um, Eric Walsh. Um, um, sometimes um, I, I get in touch with um, um, Zombo. Um, I was uh, I played. You know, sometimes I I even email back and forth with TJ Long because mm-hmm. he was in the Mac. And um and to be honest, a lot of people don't. I mean, you probably don't believe, but one a guy that's a real good friend of mine to this day is Kevin Green. Mm-hmm. You know, I, me and him, um, I was I started coaching, and I, I asked him to use the reference. To be, would he be a reference for me? And he was like, Yeah, man. You know, we and he coached with the Jets. That, I know, you know Kevin. I know Kevin. He coached with the you Jets. Know, so, Right, so after that it was more of um, a great relationship. So it's um, so I got a few guys that I can reach out: Reggie Smith, Curtis Taylor, you know, guys I play with San Fran, Scott McKenna, you know. So it's a lot of good guys that um, I keep in contact with that I really created a bond with, you know. Because once again, you know, after you know, I don't want to. It's kind of like a <laughs> when you're there, everybody's talking to you, but when you ain't there, nobody even heard of mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, you know. I know. But, you know, not, not to get some guys, great experience, love it, you know, but the relationships that I got now, you know, that I, that hold on, that's, you know, that's the real one. So, Before we let you go, uh, I, why don't you tell the fans what you're doing right now? I know you said you're uh, coaching, you're teaching right now. Is there any organizations you're working with or uh, working for uh, to help, uh, you know, breast cancer or, or uh, heart disease? Is well, there any, any yeah. organization you're working with? Well, as of as of right now, um, my whole focus and what I'm trying to become a great um, um, advocate for is for kids with autism. Um, I'm a teacher for kids with autism. Um, I do one on one with um, all kids with autism on the spectrum. Um, this is something that I became in to loving, um, being my new passion, and me really changing and being an impact in life. Being that, and you. Know, me being a black man and um and being able to be in a special you know special education and it's really lacking man and uh and so I really really focus on now is you know kids with autism trying to open up my own school for kids with autism um just because a lot of people don't know um ninety i should say i want to say eighty five percent of the kids with autism um they suffer from motion you know, motor skills, you know, mm-hmm. and with being in the NFL and learning how to use and being coordinated, a lot of my stuff that I bring to the table to the kids with discipline and, and structure helps them out in the long run, you know, and and I've seen some great results and built some great relationships with some kids and, you know, and that's what I'm doing now and that's like my passion. That's so, really, that's, that's really cool, cool man. That, uh, it's really, that's, really cool. I, I really, and I envy people that put the time into the kids and, 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 and look out for other people besides themselves and their own family. So I, I really appreciate you joining us, man. And we would love to get you back on uh, when the football season starts. We would love to talk a little Green Bay Packer football. The Green Bay Packers are expected to be a Super Bowl contender this year, which is uh, might be Aaron Rodgers last year with the Green Bay Packers because a lot of people believe uh, after drafting, drafting a young quarterback – uh, like they did in the first round and moving up for him. I do believe Jordan Love will be the next starting quarterback very, very soon for the Green Bay Packers. So uh, I do believe Aaron Rodgers will be looking or uh, be playing for another team after this year. So this might be the last time any Green Bay Packer fan will see Aaron Rodgers in a Green Bay Packers uh, uniform. To be, to, and to be honest, to think about that, and, and, you know, we can get you a clothing uh I really honestly think that, you know, it's, it's kind of tough to say uh, what the record Green Bay has. They, they, you really don't retire there at Green Bay, to be mm-hmm. completely honest. The mm-hmm. uh, only person I know that kind of retired there was the driver, you know. So um, I, I hate it that, you know, they did draft the quarterback, but, you know, it's a business. You know, um, I still think a Rod got tick in, just like I seen Tom Brady do it. You know, you put him in the right position, get him around the right people, he's going to do great things, you know, because he did it with less. 
you know. <laughs> so. I say that all the time. I think Aaron Rodgers is one of the top – Five quarterbacks ever play the game. I, 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 a lot of people look at numbers and Super Bowl championships. I'm sorry. And, and as good as Tom Brady has been over the years, and they call him the GOAT, in the last 10 years, really the last eight years, the best quarterback in the NFL has been Al, um, Aaron Rodgers. And, hey, well, uh, and, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. like the, uh, and, and I hate to, and I don't want to take nothing away from Tom, mm-hmm. but once again, you put A Rod around some of the talent, you know, and some of the, that, 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 that 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 O line, you know, not say take away from a lot of our O line, but you know, in that defense, you know, you know, because think about it, everybody knows it's a good deep That head coach over there at, at the Patriots it was a D coordinator guru. Yep, he was a great defense. Bill coach. Belichick. Yep, you know what I'm saying. So with with that being said, and I've seen what A Rod does, you know, the year, and I tell people, the year that we won the Super Bowl, if you look at our O line, we had big cliffs. And shout out to Big Cliff. He was one of the, I feel like one of the best left, you know, I think right tackles, I believe, whatever one played the game. But he was on his last leg. We had some rookies. And A Rod took us all the way because he was a great quarterback, man. And a lot of his throws was like 99% accuracy was on the run, stepping up on the pocket. Everybody's seen what he does. That's a great quarterback, man. He makes things happen, you know. He kind of it's like it's like what y'all see in P. Holmes, man. Patrick, Patrick Holmes, that boy is special too. Mm-hmm. So, well, here one more question before we let you go. Somebody wants to know this: Steve Young or Aaron Rodgers? Who would you pick? Ooh, Steve Young or Aaron Rodgers? Mm-hmm. You know what? And this me and, and, and this is me being biased. It's neck to neck, but since I play with a Rod. I'm gonna go with A. Rod because I, you know, I play with him and I seen, I done seen him throw some, I done seen him throw some stuff on him in them deep balls, man. I done seen him throw some deep balls in mean games, right? And, that's, and, and, and the difference with Steve, I done seen Steve do it more with his leg, mm-hmm. you know. So it's kind of like next and next, but they, but I take nothing away from Steve, uh, great quarterback. Great quarterback, but I'm going to be biased. I'm going to go with my boy A. Rod. <laughs> <laughs> Dyra, why don't you tell the fans how they can find you on social media? What you say? I'm sorry. Why don't you tell the fans how they can find you on social media, my friend? Uh, you guys can follow me on um, Instagram. Um, it's Cincinnati um, BB1985. Um, like I said, I'm from Cincinnati. Um, my name is Darrell Briggs, and I'm born 1985. Very easy. Um, most of the things you see on there is encouraging things with my kids. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just me working out, you know, just a shout out to my kids. We get up every day at 530, mm-hmm. run two miles and do a circuit. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. You're, how old are your kids that you're working them already? I got an eight-year-old, a oh. 12-year-old, and then another 12-year-old. And even play yeah. football? Uh, my son, he, uh, I got a son and two girls. My son, he's a baseball, he loves hitting, you know, and I told my kids, um, whatever you do, if it's not sports, we're going to be great at it. So mm-hmm. he wants to play baseball. So, you know, we work on baseball. Then my two girls is a softball and the other one is a basketball. But I'm hoping my son, because he's a little thick and strong, I'm hoping once he gets older, he see what daddy did and he want to live on and start like, let's go. <laughs> 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 like, I've been waiting for this, son. You, this is why I got this ring for you, man. <laughs> Come on. You're, you're, you got a cousin, Lance Briggs, who's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I mean, serious. Man, right, you know, I, it's in a bloodline, man. So uh-huh. I'm like, man, let's do it. Dude. We gotta, we gotta get you and Lance on a video chat, both of you on this show. That would be interesting and funny. <laughs> it, it, it'd be good. And then I tell you another thing: we could probably look him up. We also had an uncle that started. He was on the Dallas team. It's funny that you said it. he was on the Dallas team in '94 when they won. His name was Greg Briggs. He was the start. He was a state. He was 43. He was a safety. He backed up. Um, he actually backed up. I think it was Woodson at the time. Um, and he played special teams and he won a ring out there. So we got it in our bloodline. All right. So you got to get your you got to get your son involved, man. That's what you got to do. Man, I'm trying. <laughs> I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you. And and by the way, I would love to help you with uh, everything that you're doing with autism because I I'm a true believer. When you put the time and effort into other people that need, you know, need that, you know, need the help and and need your help, it, it's not only rewarding; it, it helps you as a person. So I would love to help you. So if you ever, man, if you ever need any help, you, I would love to help you. Man, you know what's honest? You know what's really 
great about what you just said is that, you know, I feel like this opportunity was that, you know, um, actually, you know, because before you guys reached out, you know, I, like I said, I've just been a dad, man, just dad, you know, take care of my family doing this, you know, this whole epidemic, you know, this whole thing, pandemic, you know, what's going on and, um, you know, and just still trying to reach out to kids with autism. Then, you know, you guys reached out through an interview and I'm like, oh man, I felt, I felt honored. I, I'm going to say I felt honored and I'm blessed to be, you know, on you know, on this radio station today. Well, we feel say, blessed to have you. you. We, we feel blessed to have you, man. And, and shout out to Jillian and Ricky because they're the ones our social media managers. They run everything. They reach out to some of the people on social media. And we want to get you back on, Dyrell, because you, you gave us some good insight. And you know you know A-Rod, what you call A-Rod. We call A-Rod and Alex Rodriguez. You call him an Aaron Rodgers. So we got two A-Rods. <laughs> right, right. You know, because when I say A-Rod, be like, who is I'm like, yeah, my A-Rod is different. We do them things. You know? <laughs> That's really, no, really cool, I, man. I really, really, guys, I honestly um, appreciate it. Like I, I was talking to a guy, you know, earlier um, yesterday, uh, about, you know, after this, I would love to just get on here and just shoot the, you know, the crap with you guys just to talk and up the agency what's going on, man. I'm I'm all for that, man. So um, I, I hope that this leads to, a, you know, a, a long, good relationship, man. Absolutely. And, I, and, and the last one, and I hope everybody tuning in, you keep tuning in. Um, I had a great time. These were great guys. Um, I'm loving the vibe. And um, I hope everybody's staying healthy and blessed. And um, I hope we all just remember that it, it's, it's, we all believe the same and we all is just one, you know. And I agree with you. Guess, I agree uh, with you. I agree with you. Everything that's going on in the world, I think everybody has to understand we're all one. We're all made the same way. We're all the same. Yeah. About, we're, we all were born with the same hands, the same arms, the same legs, the same bodies. We should all be one. We shouldn't be fighting. This is ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So much love, man. I appreciate it, man. And um, hopefully you hear from you guys soon. Absolutely. Dyrell, thank you. All right, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dyrell Briggs, ladies and gentlemen, linebacker, played for the Super Bowl champions in 2009, the Green Bay Packers. Uh, one of the best uh, runs because they were the first real, I guess you could say, well, they were the second. They were a, they were a sixth seed. I think they were the second. The, I think six seed. I think they were the yeah the second sixteen because the Steelers did it in two thousand five. Yeah. So they would be the second sixteen to do that. And he was mentioning uh, all those great teams he had to knock off too, and all the all the great plays to go with it, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball, which again wasn't their main thing, but it was right. a very important thing. And it was right. they had a lot more great players, and a lot of people give them credit for. Absolutely, that's it for our show, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank uh, Riley Wilson. Great interview from Hawaii. Uh, he'll be doing the Dougie when he scores a touchdown if there yeah. is a season this year. And I'd like to take I'd like to ta take the chance to uh, uh, thank uh, all the fans and. Packers Super Bowl champion linebacker Dyrell Briggs for coming on with us and talking a little bit about his career, autism, and, and really his insight mm -hmm. of where the Green Bay Packers were and where they are today. So uh, thank you, Dyrell, for joining us. Uh, we will be back next week. They will not be caged in MMA. That's next week. We're going to have uh, – I think we're going to have a UFC fighter on next week. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, we'll be back down to the wire below the mic on Thursday. And this weekend, ladies and gentlemen – if you haven't checked it out, uh, the first FM FM radio show, sports radio show here in Long Island in almost 30 years, uh, me and Eric Coleman, The Weekend Crunch, uh, it will be airing at 7 p.m. LI News Radio. If you're not here in New York to check it out on the FM dial because uh, it's only a 55-mile radius here in, in Long Island, all you have to do is go to uh, Google LI News Radio and you can find us, you can listen to the show live at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Until next week, this is Errol Mark, Speedy PD, and below the mic saying good night. We'll talk to you then. Good night, everybody. It is the Worldwide Sports Radio Network.